Hello, and welcome to Office Hours. We're a show that answers your questions about media and virtual production. Typically, our show will have a full first hour where you're able to submit your questions into our Q&A uh, system, which is called Mukana. And then we'll go on to something we want to spend a little more time on. Usually our second hour is a special guest or a topic that we focus on. On Saturdays, we have Education Hour. And October is actually um, Disability Awareness Month. So we have John Snyder and Laura Thompson, and we'll look forward to them. So stay with us after the break, and then we'll move into our education hour. Mitchell, what do we got? Oh, I'm sorry. No, Lois. Miss <laughs> Lois is here for us. Uh, hello, this is Lois, and I'm a new reader, so bear with me. First question, YouTube now has the ability to upload multiple audio tracks for a video, even after it's been posted, that users can select between using the YouTube player. It's intended for dubbed translations. Could Office Hours use it to post the show Calling or Comms? Interesting question from our friend Andy Carluccio. Um, Courtney, what do you think? Well, I haven't tried it, but I will offer my opinion, which, you know, but just because I haven't tried it, that's never stopped me from offering my opinion. The uh, I would wonder if uh, it's an either or situation. So if you choose the alternate soundtrack, if it mutes the original soundtrack, that way, I think it would not be very good because then you wouldn't hear what's going on on the actual program channel of Office Hours. You'd only hear what's going on on the comms unless that particular mix has the program mixed in with it. Uh, so I think it would be distracting, but maybe those of the those from the back end, like Jonas is here, can answer that question uh, about whether it's mixed in or whether it's exclusive. God, Jonas, I would say um, we probably would need to create our own mix for it. Um, I don't see them doing dubbing in browser, but that certainly is a possibility uh, from the tech stack. Um, I think the bigger problem might be to have records that are. Um, at the same point, because like we would need to record it uh, somewhere else. And since we don't re-upload our live streams, we would need to then add uh, the backend audio to it, and we would need to time it correctly. And that might be a little more difficult and more tedious than what we want. And Mitchell? Yeah, I agree with uh, <clears throat> the preceding comments. Um, also, I'm just afraid that some people are going to mess it up. In other words, leave comms on while the show's going, and that can be very distracting. Um, I think you need some kind of uh, explanation as to how to manage multiple channels before you endeavor to go in there. Otherwise, you're going to have all kinds of stuff going on at the same time and making it very hard to follow the uh, continuity of the show. I wonder how long this uh, feature has been a thing. So I'm interested to see how it's people utilize it. They announced it yesterday. The interesting yesterday. thing is it already has been a thing. So like years and years ago, there has been this multi-stream version that was really cool because you could select between different cameras. So like game streamers used it to have like a group of friends play. There's like a master cut and then you can cut to the singles. Um, so it's really interesting for them to bring it back and hopefully one day they bring back uh, multiple videos as well so we can have easy integration for ASL and the different sign languages. Oh, gotcha, you. So it's been reintroduced. Is that what you're saying? First got killed by Google, and now it's getting reintroduced. So we'll, we'll see if this <laughs> survives for more than a year. It's like bring back Mac ports. Fantastic. Let's go to our next question. This is from Paul. This yep, is from that's Paul. how that's how he that's how he says it. <laughs> okay, this is from Paul Volkhaus in Cedar Creek. And it says, FileZilla is an awesome FTP program for the PC, and there's also a Mac version. How does it compare to some of the Mac FTP programs we've discussed, like Transmit, which has more of a Mac feel? Peter? Well, I, I've used both. I, I just find I use CyberDuck on my Macs. It's been around since 2001 on the Macs and is much more integrated into the look and feel of what you would expect from a Mac, which made it easier for me to teach my kids how to use it than try and inflict a Windows machine on them. So I uh, I much prefer the look and feel. Go ahead, Mitchell. 
Yeah, I'm a fan of old uh, stuff, and uh, FileZilla is one of those old programs that are around as long as FTP, practically, on the Mac. And um, I think it's just gotten very comfortable to use. Um, I'm not looking for an update on a GUI to use. I'm just interested in using FTP the way it normally is. But FTP kind of fallen out of favor. It's not uh, uh, your port 21 uh, program uh, is not as much used as it used to be. Have you got a chance to try it, John? I have had a chance to try it on the PC side at work. That's what we use to upload our e-learning modules to a shared folder. And FileZilla is fine. It's a little bit uh, difficult to read and hard to teach people how to use. Um, it, it's just not intuitive how you drag and drop a folder from one computer to another machine. FileZilla makes it OK. Uh, on the Mac side, I much prefer Forklift is my uh, tool of choice. It makes the file system feel like it's directly integrated with whatever you're trying to FTP. Is that a free app, John? No, but it goes on sale pretty regularly for less than $5. Okay, great. And Lois? Yeah, I use Fetch, and I've used Fetch for years and years and years, and uh, I love it. Thank you, Lois. Let's go to our next question. This is from me, Lois Richter in Davis, California. If I plug a hose into a spigot, I get a certain water volume and pressure. If I use a splitter to attach two hoses, the volume and pressure in each are reduced. How does electricity work? Does a power strip give each device less power? All right, we'll have to look for our electrical know-how. We'll start with Courtney. That is uh, Ohm's law, or in the case of water, um, I don't know, I guess it would be tightened to law. No, that, that, uh, a different law. No, they behave similarly uh, in that uh, the reason your uh, water pressure drops is because of resistance, which is the restriction of the pipe that's serving the original uh, spigot before you divided it. It can only pass a certain volume of water uh, based on the amount of pressure. And the pressure is usually limited in a home by a pressure restriction device. Electricity is the same way. If you have an outlet strip, uh, your pressure or your, your power, the current that can be delivered, is determined by the uh, power handling capability of the wire on that, um, that leads to that power strip. So if it's a very narrow wire, uh, it's going to either get very hot and... Uh, switch off because it has a high resistance and it can't deliver the current that the uh, electrical service it's plugged into can deliver. The same is true of your water spigot. You know, your your uh, uh, water company can deliver a certain amount of pressure to your house and that's usually limited by a pressure valve. Um, and if you didn't have that pressure valve, you would get uh, uh, the same, you know, more volume out of two hoses. Uh, because there wouldn't be a limitation on the pressure, there wouldn't be a resistance. But um, because that resistance limits the amount of flow, that's going to be the amount that you can get out, uh, regardless of the amount of divisions that you have in the hose. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, Courtney deserves the Mr. Wizard Explanation Award. If you remember Mr. Wizard, he was very articulate, as is Courtney. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, uh, electricity wants to go to the path of least resistance. And uh, if there is small amount of resistance, almost negligible in a power strip, it's going to go to however many outlets you have on it up to the uh, resistance of the uh, the whole electrical system in a house. So generally not an issue to wor worry about. But used precisely, resistance could be a, your friend too because you can use it to split audio, for example, and maintain impedance and uh, deliver that uh, same signal to multiple lo locations, but it does reduce the uh, the volume or uh, power of that signal. Go ahead, Peter. Um, going right back to your power strip analogy, though, Lois, I would I would often caution you: power strip does not. If you plug that power strip into a 15 amp wall socket, you have 15 amps total to play with, independent of the number of things that are plugged into that power strip. So. That's the one thing you always have to worry about, right? Is don't overpopulate the power strip. It does cut it. You know, if there are two things and you want to be really simplistic about it, it each can pull half the amount of, of amperage. Or and lowest. Can, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Peter. Yeah. 
before you well, finish. Thank, thank you, okay. Peter. And I think that answers what I was wondering about was how many things could I plug in at once to a power strip? Can you plug one power strip into another and just keep going? And I think what I hear you saying is it isn't the things, it's how much it is using at any given time. I hope I got that right. Uh, yeah. 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 You want to think about there's there's voltage and current. So we we use the analogy of water where the current is how much the water is is flowing in this particular channel and the voltage is how is how fast it's flowing. Um, our electrical outlets are in parallel. So that means they'll get the same voltage no matter what you plug in. What changes is how much current you have available to each one. So the more things you plug in, the more current it takes. They'll all get the same um, mains voltage. Um, what happens is when you plug too many things, that's whenever your breaker trips because your breaker will trip to make sure that the lines going to your device don't melt. So they'll only give out so much current and then they'll be done. And that's per circuit, but it's also per strip or whatever you're plugging into. So you are adding additional, you, you can think of it just adding another another few amps, another few amps, the more things that you add on to things. And if you have amps to spare, you can continue to um, daisy chain them since it's in parallel, you'll get the same voltage out of them, but um, the current will be used up in that. And Courtney? Did you have another thought? Yeah, you you explained pretty much everything I was going to say, except that uh, if you do reach the the current delivering capability of your source, uh, then the voltage will start to drop. And so as you increase resistance, uh, because of uh, you cannot deliver enough current to all the devices, then the voltage will start to drop across the voltage across all the devices. Lois. And how would I figure out how much draw each thing has? Is it like written on the back or something? It is. Uh, on every device, it lists uh, how much uh, voltage it takes and how much current it takes, If at least if it's UL listed. And remember, current is equal to volts divided by resistance. That's Ohm's law. Right. It's also volts times amps. So given that our mains voltage is typically, you know, the same um, here in the United States, it's 120 volts on a typical uh, branch circuit. You can divide that by the number of uh, watts. Uh, you can divide the watts into that and figure out how many amps something is. If it doesn't say on there how many amps it's drawing. And you've only got typically 20 of them uh, on, a, on a typical branch circuit. So Lois, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate our answer? Fantastic. That's a Let's fun go to our next question. Next question is from Paul Vulhaus. I'm sorry, Paul Valhus. I always have trouble with that one. I will get better, I promise. And Paul asks, besides passwords, what are the other uses of LastPass and one password? Go ahead, guy. Yeah, credit card information. So if you're on the road or maybe you're just too lazy to go get your wallet because uh, it's in a different location, you can have all your credit card information sorted in there. You could have addresses, you can have uh, Wi-Fi passwords, you can have notes, uh, secure notes. The nice thing about um, LastPass, at least the one that I use, is that uh, you, know, you can have the dual authentication. So when you, they call it two-factor. So like uh, you could use an authenticator app uh, or a keychain to uh, make sure that if somebody does keyboard track your your uh, main password, that they still would need some other kind of authentication. The other nice thing that uh, we like about LastPass is that uh, if somebody departs from your organization, you have all their passwords, you could just suck them all in. And uh, for like our social media marketing person, uh, we're able to just pull all those back in. And that way, the next person that comes in, we just give them access to those same passwords. Go ahead, John. As a 1Password user, the other features that I like to use a lot are the authentication tokens. So you can actually have your MFA token generated by 1Password. And the other thing I do is the notes function, like I was describing. If there's ever information I know I want available, but I don't want um, prying eyes to see it, like, uh, for example, my insurance policy numbers, I just, instead of scanning in all the information, I just put a note with each of the members of my family and their policy number. It makes it really easy to retrieve that sort of information. Thanks. Next question. 
And this comes from Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida. What devices do the panel connect and use with their iPad Pro? Let's start with Guy. Yeah, one thing that I learned from Grant is that if you have the Magic Keyboard, that there is an, another USB-C port on the side here. So in addition to the USB-C here, uh, which tie, gets tied up on mine with an Ethernet adapter, and it also gives me additional USBs, uh, you can put power in this one. Um, the other thing that I'll plug in is additional power. So I have my anchor battery, uh, another battery, and good old handy mix pre. So mix pre, you can get professional audio into your iPad via USB-C. And I believe all of the iPads now have the USB-C over the lightning connector. Go ahead, Nigel. Yeah, two things. The Magic Keyboard when I'm on the road, which is the best keyboard I've ever used outside of a typical PC or Mac keyboard. And then on my desk, I have it in a Satachi desktop holder. I'll put the link in Makana. And that gives me uh, not only power, but it gives me the ability to take HDMI out and put other devices in. It's about 100 bucks, and it sits on my desk all the time. Mitchell? I like to use mine to control remotely my camera. Um, it works great. Um, I don't understand. I bought it on Amazon, and people on After Hours have been telling me that it's not a Mac Pro or iPad Pro. And I'm insisting that it is indeed an iPad Pro. It says it right here. So if anybody, you know, questions whether or not I got too good a price, this is a pro. Taken from a pro. Uh, Tony. Oh, boy. Thank you, Mitchell, for that. Um, I connect it simply with a stand. I have a stand that's from the floor up to almost level with my monitor. It's connected with the um, Apple adapter, and I have HDMI and um, the uh, USB-C connected, and that all goes into my Atom Mini Pro, and that is the way I'm connecting my, my iPad. Peter. Um, I'm surprised nobody's brought this one up. I kind of connect my Samsung T5 hard drives and in, into the iPad Pro and use the files application to get to stuff on there and open them up in the applications. I what brought this to mind was now, how would I get my DaVinci B-Raw files over into DaVinci? I will say that um, connecting audio uh, directly into an iPad works a bit better than Android devices. I'll give them that one. Let's go to our next question. Oh, I think you're muted, Lois. Guy Cochran from Seattle, USA says, a live event mishap? What's something that went wrong during a show that could have been prevented? Guy, is there a story? Nope, I was just throwing a softball out there. I thought that Jonas uh, <laughs> might have something that uh, occurred, but he's not raising his hand. Uh, Courtney, I guess. Um, go, oh, sorry. I think I misread that. Go ahead, Courtney. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one was kind of, it wasn't my fault, but I was the embarrassee. Um, on a live show, uh, uh, there were, it was an international show with lots of people coming in from all over the world. We did lots of rehearsals. Our rehearsals went great. Everything went fine. I was running the teleprompter. And we had lots of prepared speeches uh, by people who were not really great English speakers, so it was a little bit, little bit difficult there. Uh, but uh, in the middle of the show, apparently, or maybe before the show, uh, one of the recipients or people that were going to be speaking um, didn't arrive, pulled out. And nobody bothered to tell me on the comms. I was on comms the entire time. And so I had a big speech for that person, and there was a choir that was supposed to sing, and there was a whole production number that was supposed to happen. And they pulled that right before the show started and didn't bother to tell me about it. So it was all still in the teleprompter. And so as teleprompters go, you know, you scroll 
pass from one item to the next item to the next item. So I had that item up uh, when the person after that person that I had up on the teleprompter came onto the stage, I was surprised and went, well, what happened to this guy? And then I hear over the comms, oh, we pulled that. I went, oh, it would have been nice to tell the teleprompter guy so I could have pulled it before the show started so we wouldn't, I wouldn't have to be madly scrolling through the teleprompter through all the stuff and making the people on the stage go, well, uh, uh, bye, uh, uh, I can't read. <laughs> as it's goes scrolling by. So that's my big mishap. And if they had just bothered to tell me on the comms, hey, by the way, we pulled this. They told each other, but they didn't tell me. And during our stories, our names have been changed to protect the innocent. Tony, what's your story? I have quite a, quite a few, but I'll just share one. Um, I was having a conversation with Benjamin at put on conversation with Tony Mobley. And we were having a great conversation and probably in the middle of the conversation, all of my uh, equipment failed and the back end and, and Benjamin were able to continue and have a great conversation, but I was, I was out, everything failed. And one of the things that I learned from that is that no matter what, I always reset everything. I restart my computer, I reset the ATEM, I reset, make sure that all the software is update, updated at least a day before uh, a live uh, event. And I, I double and triple check everything. See, that's what I did before the show. See, I, I said to Mitchell, I said, Mitchell, you got my back, right? Uh, go ahead, Peter. I'll just suffice to say that somebody forgot to change the batteries on the wireless mics. And so a third of the way into the event, everybody went quiet. So checklists or checklists. would be the, fresh, the winner fresh for that batteries. one. Fresh set of batteries. There you go, Lois. So this is current. Something that goes wrong for me is this microphone stuff. I don't want my room noise to get in the way, so I try and turn off my mic when I'm not talking. But then I sometimes forget to turn it on. So I have to figure out with you folks whether it's better to leave it on and not have those oopses or leave it off so you don't hear background noise. So I'm still working on that one. And Mitchell. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that I've done the classic rookie error of leaving the wireless mic hot uh, during a break when the uh, the head speaker was speaking and uh, he had to take a bio break and the rest uh, almost was the history sealing the fate of my future in audio. Uh, but the worst part of it, it got worse, uh, was when he was talking to somebody in the hallway, he said, I can't wait to get out of this gig. I got to get to San Diego as fast as I can. And when he came on stage, everybody was staring at him like this. He's like, what, what? Fantastic. We could have probably a whole uh, second hour on production woes and how to prevent them. Let's go to our next question. Again, from Paul Woolhouse in Balhus in Cedar Creek. Will there be a comprehensive exhaustive index and table of contents of all questions and answers asked on the office hours someday? John? Uh, and I have a, a follow-up question. I don't have an answer to that, but how would we even track if the same questions asked on multiple days, like how do you tell us straight, how would you even begin to categorize that? Guy, maybe Guy has our answer. Um, there was a person, uh, Barry, I believe it was, uh, his site is Be Original. He started doing it. I don't know why he stopped, but he has a... Um, a list of all the questions, as well as the link right to the YouTube uh, timestamp. So that was pretty cool, but it's not going on anymore. But if somebody, I'll put a link in the chat as to his format. If somebody else wants to take the torch and run, I think it'd be pretty cool to have it. Yanis? Congratulations, Paul. Uh, we just award you with a new job. <laughs> uh, we are looking forward to uh, you watching through all the other episodes and giving us a link. We'll uh, expect a report next week. Oh, come on, Jonas. I mean, I think we have some automation we could help Paul out with a little bit. Uh, Mitchell? Yeah, don't forget to add gaffes and screw-ups. I think they're sometimes more entertaining. Courtney? 
Well, I don't know if this would work, but um, here's an idea. If we turned on closed captioning, uh, perhaps Google has a search method that would work to search within a channel for any particular topic which is contained in the closed captioning text. So if we were to turn on closed captioning, maybe it's turned on now, I'm not sure. Uh, so that Google will caption all of our episodes automatically for them. It would make a transcription of each episode then contained on YouTube. And so uh, maybe YouTube has a way to search within the entire channel, within each individual video for, you know, that topic. And maybe could return the, the video and the time stamp of each occurrence of that topic. Tony? Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, we, we can ask the same question day after day and have different answers day after day. And I was just wondering um, what the possibilities of an exhaustive list like that would be from the standpoint that our knowledge base constantly changes. And so we would basically just have a list of questions with a varied uh, answers. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, how useful that would be as we continue to innovate and create and get new information, new data, new uh, um, processes for doing things. And Jonas, you have another thought? Actually, is a search engine called Filmod that is um, using the automatic captioning that was enabled for our YouTube channel to uh, search all the videos. So you can just uh, put any term you want in here and you'll uh, get every single time someone says it, you can search for your name, then you get every time someone says your name. Uh, or you can search for the word ATEM, MixPre, and you'll find loads of loads of questions. And uh, we are starting to have a big backlog on the Office Hours Global channel, but also if you uh, change the channel to the Alex Lindsay channel, um, you have all the old episodes and can find stuff in there as well. Yeah, now as far as the answers, I, you know, it makes sense to me. Our Mukana, um, obviously, uh, is is text that we put in, and we have a YouTube uh, system to where the timestamps of where that answer gets answered on the YouTube as well. So it makes sense that it's possible to have those questions, but with the questions are already in text that we wouldn't have to, you know, uh, be able to uh, intuit what those were and what they were. Paul asks exhaustive index of table of contents of all questions and ask answers. So you could find the question by the text in theory, and then the timestamp of where that was answered in YouTube uh, at least could be given. And if you wanted to do the further text to speech, I, that'd probably be an extra lift, but that would give you an answer of some place to go back and look at where those questions are. I mean, they're right now they're embedded right on the YouTube, right? So it seems like you could go back and find that question and find the answer to it, but um, nothing yet, but maybe someday. Uh, Paul, we'll, we'll put you in charge of the, of the charge there. Let's go to our next question. And the next question is from Mike Beardmore in Reading UK. How are people planning to take advantage of their new at user and URL names in the new YouTube options? Jonas? I think one of the greatest things is that you'll finally be able to uh, claim all these names and short tags that have been locked up by a channel that never uploaded, never interacted. Like there's a lot of dead channels on YouTube. And they kind of found a nice way to uh, free up some names without telling all of these dead channels, hey, you haven't uploaded for a year or you didn't participate for 10 years in this. Uh, well, Nick, your channel, no, it's a new thing. And every one that is active gets a new chance to uh, redeem the name. Nice. Let's go to our next question. This is from Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. What are ways to prolong the life, extend the warranty, and be prepared for a, quote, fail, unquote, of the B-Link by Courtney? That's a trademark. Is B-Link itself supportive? Mitchell? 
Well, I'm speaking to somebody that pulls the uh, tags off his sofa that says do not remove under penalty of law. Um, I would hold off on sending the uh, the warranty card until the last minute. And uh, my secondary option would be to call Courtney direct. Um, I'll be happy to post his phone number and contact information <laughs> on panel chat. Be like by Courtney, support by probably someone else. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. I'll be forwarding my phone to Mitch's personal cell phone. <laughs> Uh, right. uh, B-Link, I've never had a problem with them. Uh, they do have a support online uh, where they offer support. Uh, it seems pretty comprehensive for each individual device. Uh, you can go there. Uh, they do have service and repair and drivers and hardware, things like that. So go online is a good place to start for support. Uh, uh, I don't know if they're, they are, a, you know, uh, originally a Chinese company. They do have international phone numbers posted on their website, which is more than I can say for some other companies that, you know, don't have great support. You don't get an extended warranty just by saying Courtney sent me? Huh? No, no. No, it's a pity. Let's go to our next question. This is from Mike Beardmore in Reading, UK. How do the M1, A14, and A15 compare in function on the new iPads? Noting the iPad mini was not updated. Start with Nigel and then John. So I want to ask the, answer the question in a slightly roundabout way, that if you go to the website today for Apple, you'll find that there are five or six different iPads for sale. But fundamentally, you've got the, the new Pro, which is M2. You've got the, the new Air, which is M1. You've got um, you know the, the 10th generation, which has a non-M processor in it. And then the rest are just price points. And there are two ways of thinking about this. One, there may be a specific feature of one of those iPads you want. If you want more than 256 gigabytes of memory, you're going to have to go with the Pro. If you want the yellow, you're going to have to go with the iPads. There may be a specific, a different usage. Uh, scenario that you have that will drive to you to a unique model. Otherwise, what you're really looking at is a good, better, best across the range and decide how much you want to pay and how much you want to use it and how much you're really going to use the capacity of that machine. I will tell you one of the reasons I have a pro is I really wanted the largest possible screen. That might seem a silly usage scenario for you, but that's what drove, for instance, my decision. John? In function, my iPad mini does everything I need as fast as I need it to do it in a form factor that I prefer. And so in function, it serves my needs perfectly well. And I think a lot of times we always try to just get the best or the newest thing, but it really is like um, Nigel was saying, what's your purpose? What are you using it for? And then buy the iPad that works for you, whatever piece of silicon's inside of it. Yeah, and the note about the minis not being updated, they don't update the mini quite as often as the other ones. And it just I think it just got one about a year ago too. So I don't think it'll be uh, struggling along. And I believe that, yeah, they put a USB-C port on that as well. So uh, let's go to our next question. From Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas. In this day and age, is it possible to have a career at an IBM, a Tivoli, an MSFT, et cetera? What is the emerging company model of a company like Tesla? And discuss gig economy versus startup culture. Courtney? Well, thanks to the fact that we're in a bit of a recession right now, most of the major companies are doing layoffs right now. So... Hiring isn't great at uh, Microsoft or IBM or Tivoli. They're, uh, in fact, Microsoft just laid off another 1,000 employees. And a lot of the major, even media companies, which there's a media, fr to, uh, media frenzy going on right now to create media for all these streaming channels, even those are cutting back, especially in the, in the uh, corporate suites, are laying off mid-level managers. And a lot of marketing people are getting laid off that were kind of... Uh, from flabby marketing departments uh, because of the recession. They have to increase their bottom line and keep them from bleeding money during this inflationary time. So a lot of those big companies are uh, cutting back, eliminating some employees, and it's going across the board. Uh, executives and uh, middle-level and lower-level uh, jobs are being sacrificed as well. Tesla is in the middle of a growth spurt, but that doesn't prevent them from being uh, a victim of inflation. 
and they can't get enough batteries anyway to make enough cars, so that could be a problem. So there may be big layoffs there. Amazon, I think, is even laying off people, uh, which is unusual because they usually put on a lot of temporary people right before the holidays. So, And Nigel? Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, it is possible. I know people who've done that transition from those three companies, although I have to tell you since... IBM bought Tivoli, it's probably Tivoli, IBM, Microsoft is the sequence you would go uh, rather than the other way around. Either way, uh, it is absolutely possible to get jobs in those large companies, but it's really very skill-based. So if you have a unique and portable skill, I can tell you that if you're particularly good at microelectronics and testing and those things, then you can jump between practically all of the companies in the world, be that Intel, uh, AMD, Microsoft, Tesla. I mean, I've seen people with microelectronics skills move across all of those on a, on a fairly regular basis. But I think the most important thought is the next generation won't think about their jobs that way. And someone once said to me, you know, my generation, which is sort of the end of the baby boomers, early Gen X, we have, we have sort of seven careers or seven jobs, maybe seven jobs in our lifetime, whereas the next generation is going to have 35 careers. And I think people are going to be much less stuck in particular job skills and jump much more from company to company. Yeah, nice discussion there. Let's go to our next question. And before I read the question, I want you to know that you can add questions at any time, including this time. From John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. What's your approach to managing files, whether electronic, email, or physical? Are you highly structured or do you lean on search? And it's a nice question. By John. Um, I've noticed that um, particularly different schemes, um, they've gone from tagging things as opposed to hierarchical structures. But oh, our panelists have weighed in. Let's have uh, Lois and then Courtney. Well, I spent my personal career as the organizer. That was the name of my business. And so helping people find the things that they've put away is one of the things I did. I don't consider a file structure, but a retrieval structure. I am a person who wants to have identified a topic, a subject, a why do I need this bit of information thing. So I like to file things or organize things in a hierarchical place. But being a librarian, I also want cross-reference cards. That's in the physical world. That's also in my electronic and email. And it gets really complicated when I have five different places on this computer that stuff is stored and I can't get all of it done at once. I haven't been much of a searcher and because that wasn't what I grew up with. Courtney. Well, I kind of depend on search on the current connected computers. My problem is I own hundreds of computers, and they're never all connected at the same time. Look, here's two. Here's a B-Link and a, a Melee. Uh, and what I do is I will take the important files, the files that I need all the time when I'm running any of these mini, mini computers or tiny computers or thumbsticks or whatever. I put them on a micro SD card. And I put all, so I'll build up these micro SD cards with all my important files on it, uh, all the programs I've written that I need for doing video playback, you know, sampled video playback files, et cetera, test files. And I'll put them on that micro SD card, and uh, I'll have several of those, and I'll put them in either thumb, thumb style USB readers. Uh, so, and I always carry one on my keychain with all the important files on it. So I can set up a new PC and put all my important files on it. As long as I have the keys to my car, <clears throat> I know I have all those important files. So uh, that's what I use for organization of files. If I want to search for something and it was on one of my mini computers, I will never find it if I didn't put it on that little uh, micro SD card. John? For me personally, I find that too much structure makes it really difficult for me to find things. But whenever I have information I have to share with others, like at work, I do have some minimal file structures. I try not to do more than about two levels of hierarchy. Uh, with regarding paper files, I've about two years ago moved to a caching system where basically when I pull out a file, I just put it at the front of the drawer because you're much more likely to need something at the front of your file drawer than you will further back. And it saves time uh, to just keep stuff organized that way. And Tony? 
I'm mine is kind of simple in that I use Apple Notes pretty much for everything that I think is important. And so I have it on whatever device I have handy. If it's on an iPad, it's on a Mac, it's on uh, an iPad, my phone, I have everything there. The other thing that I do is that if something is really important to me, particularly an email or something, you know, information that I've gathered, I will email it to an additional email so that it is now in more than one place. Let's go to our next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia writes, I have not used my Raspberry Pi in about eight months. What do I do besides connect AT Mini Pro and power up? Any update software? Mitchell? Yeah, there's a huge collection of apps that run on a Raspberry Pi. And, you know, I kind of consider them to sort of be a bespoke device that allows you to enable a piece of software uh, to act like a piece of hardware. Uh, and one excellent uh, piece of software to use would be Playout B by Jonas Dattel here, who's uh, the inventor. And it's a great way to replace a uh, um, a, uh, a shuttle deck or other pro a, a device for playing back audio and video on your uh, on your program. So there, is, there you go. And, that, and it becomes a bespoke piece of equipment just for playing back stuff. And we have time real quick to have uh, Tony and Peter. So it was really sort of, uh, I, I saw Jonas coming in, so it was really to, toward him. We we did talk a little bit about it yesterday in terms of, we didn't talk, we didn't talk but I, I asked the question after hours. And I really want to start to utilize the uh, play out B. So that's why I asked the question. Peter? So I guess the question really be to Jonas, I mean, if it were up to me, I would just pull the latest image down from the site. You're, you're all in one image and just load it back on if it's changed. If it hasn't changed, leave it as is because it's a fully tested configuration. Jonas? I would say um, for now, if it works, let it work on that specific version. There's a couple of issues right now that we're still chasing with. Edits that the ATEM sends and edits that the Raspberry Pi reads and audio output. So if you are happy with the installation that you have, just stay on that till we uh, migrate to version 1.0. Next question. Paul Valhus in Austin, Texas says, what's the oldest iPad that will accept the newest OS for it? Peter. So I guess it depends on the model. The iPad Air is the third generation iPad Air. If it's the iPad Mini, it's the fifth generation. If it's the i the regular iPad, it's the uh, fifth generation again. Um, iPad Pro, it looks like it's goes all the way down to the 9.7 inch iPad Pros. When if you remember those, and of course, obviously the current iPad Pros, up to including the one they announced this last week are all supported. So Mitchell? Not very scientific of me, but uh, I kind of break them down based on the connectors on the back of them. If you got a 30 pin, you're out of luck. Um, if you have a lightning, you're getting out of luck. And you've got a USB-C, you're in like Flynn. <laughs> Courtney? If you go on Apple's site, they do have a nice uh, uh, page which shows you uh, iPad models compatible with iPad OS 15, and I guess they have one for 16 too. And it shows you all the generations that are compatible in the different sizes. So go there. Apple has the answers at the Genius Bar. Thanks, Courtney. Let's go to our next question. Tim Holm from San Lorenzo, California writes, the latest version of OBS does not support NDI out. Is there a workaround? Jonas? So OBS has never supported NDI out natively. What, you, um, what you're running into right now is that the NDI OBS plugin is not, uh, the release version is not updated yet to OBS 28. Since OBS 28 did a bunch of changes, uh, mostly update the UI framework. What you can do is um, there's a development version that runs pretty okay um, that you can use. But what you can also use is install NDI tools. And especially if you're using 
OBS on a Windows PC, you can now use uh, the four uh, NDI webcams that come with NDI tools and import those as web as cameras into OBS. So you get four in, and then you can take the virtual camera output from OBS and put it into scan converter and get an uh, NDI out that way. Um, if you have other tools that can do a webcam to NDI, you can also install the OBS webcam plugin, and that should give you more than one webcam output. Thank you, Jonas. Let's go to our next question. James Babbitt from San Diego writes, Hi, Josh. Is there a loopback and audio hijack workshop in the schedule? Thanks for the question, James. Um, yeah, I did reach out to Chris and Felipe. Um, they were a little tough to get their schedules to, to work together. That's why we didn't have it on an audio day. And I've asked. So stay tuned. And hopefully we'll we'll see if they're they're up to to doing that. Um, or we could have one with anyone else that wants to step up. The person to ask would be Brandon Buttram. Let's go to our next question. Tim Holm in San Lorenzo writes, what is a good color profile to export to for general use on projectors or computer screens? Rec 709? Mitchell? Yes, Rec 709 is a good one to be with. Okay, let's go to our next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana says, has anyone tried the new Shadow Tech Virtual Machine Premium Service Upgrade? Um, premium upgrade. Um, I have not. I actually um, requested more information from them, and it seemed to be slow coming. Um, Guy, have you um, have you tried that? I haven't tried it yet. It just came out yesterday. It takes an hour for it to fully populate, but it looks like uh, from my twenty nine dollar machine, it's gone up to forty nine, and then it, that'll be a uh, I have the specs here. Let's see. It's an Intel Xenon. Uh, with 12 gigs of RAM, 250 gigs SSD, and a uh, GeForce GTX 1080 or equivalent uh, from uh, the specs that I just hit on my machine. So it, it's basically like having an AWS machine but for much, much, much cheaper. An equivalent machine like this uh, on AWS would be a G4DN, probably a 4X at about a buck 25. So paying 45, 49, something like that a month. Uh, I'm excited about it. it. The difference is that you don't get a lot of the security things like Jonas uh, and I go in and we we dig and we set all these parameters, popping open ports and things like that. So we can really get granular with those instances. So when I had the original Shadow Tech, I noticed that was the shortcoming was that I couldn't uh, do some of the security firewall stuff that we can do in AWS. But for learning vMix, really cool, really, really cool. And I'm not sure if this upgrade's available to everybody. I, I happened to sign up for it a long time ago. So, and it just got released yesterday. So. In an hour, I can tell you how it is. It's it's building right now. Yanis? One thing to also keep in mind with Shadow is my understanding right now, you can have one. And if you want to have multiple that then talk to another, that's where you uh, are better suited at some point. Like AWS, again, if you want to have a Zoom room or multiple Zoom rooms or multiple vMix instances and multiple OBS instances, then that's where you jump over to AWS again. For, but for single one, instance or stuff. It's a great start. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask Guy the same thing as to whether they were just upgrading the specs or whether they gave you a little more, uh, you know, a little more service as to it. Uh, do you know, Guy? From what I can tell, it's just a single instance. But yeah, in, in Google Cloud and in Azure, I've also um, got uh, VPC. So basically with those, I'll, I just, I, um, I'll have one machine that'll be a ingest machine, one will be a, a cutting machine, and one will be an encoding machine. So I'll tie all three together with NDI. And that's really the boon of having these other machines. Otherwise, with, with like Shadow Tech, I was just bringing in uh, via the browser with um, uh, Voodoo Ninja, or Stream Voodoo or Video Ninja are two ways that you can bring in a browser and put in an ingest uh, pretty easily with those machines. Again, if you if you just want to learn vMix though, and you have a Mac, it's it's really cool. So, for those of you that uh, don't want to go commit to buying a you know two thousand dollar PC, here's where you could rent one for pretty cheap and still get access to these tools. 
Yeah, they sort of have their own little RDP program, which is a plus or a minus, depending on how you look at it. It does make things accessible from other platforms. Um, there are other ways of getting a pay per use as opposed to a pay per month. But, you know, that's very unscary to have something that, you know, has a fixed price every month. So, yeah, I agree with Guy. It's a nice uh, jumping in point. Uh, let's go to our next question. Tim Home from San Lorenzo, California. Is it possible to be live streaming from one computer source and then switch to another RTMP feed during the same stream without interrupting the stream output? Jonas? So from RTMP is a stateful protocol. So what you're going to need to do is have something in between that can switch for you. Um, there's like solutions from here up to here. Um, you can do transmuxing you can uh, where ffmpeg brings the rtmp feed in puts it into a new dpts stream that then gets picked up and uh encoded into rtmp again and then you could switch it out if you make it uh, work within the segment size of the ts stream um still there's a lot of ifs and a lot of uh cli tools then you can just use something like a shadow pc or a cloud machine with vmix and do a switch over there or you can use something like aws media life they have multiple inputs one output channels and then you can schedule changes there so if you know at 1 a.m 2 a.m you exactly at that point want to change then you can do that or you can also go the custom mcl route and have people like me or other people that have mcs in the cloud do it for you, and then you have an engineer on it looking at it. Um, there's also options with OBS and other tools, but RTMP generally is not a protocol that allows you to uh, switch. If, you, if your end output is YouTube and you're fine with a little interruption, you could also play with the failover from YouTube. Um, that might be a way, but it's not the ILD way. Very thorough. Thanks, Jonas. So let's go to our next question. Douglas Carmichael writes, AWS has the snowmobile for transporting very large data sets into AWS by truck. Have you ever had to use physical media to transfer critical content quickly, even in this age of, quote, download first, unquote? And Jonas and Peter, real quick. Well, what download first seems to miss is there's people that need to upload it first. And there's content providers, there's big studios. And even if we go down from a shoot, um, snowmobile is not used for shoots, but the smaller, the snow cones are used for shoots and sending up dailies. It's a great solution for that. And so no mobile really, really comes out. If you have a, a whole data center that you need to migrate and that's where you do the upload once, but it's so common that we still uh, send around huge files. So sometimes there is uh, just no better way. Like if you ask someone, Hey, how is your internet connection? And they say, yeah. Uh, about 10 terabytes every two weeks when uh, FedEx comes. So you'll deal with and, that. And Peter, real quick. Uh, oh, yeah. I, you know, following on to what Jonas said, I mean, I've had to move data centers around and it, lots of LT, LTO tapes get stored into a, can go fit into a truck because we're moving pentabytes worth of data. Let's go to our next question. Paul Valhus from Austin, Texas says, what was the tool Jonas alluded to for searching across YouTube? What other tools can you use to enhance and extend to YouTube? I believe that was Filmot. Is that correct, Jonas? Yeah, it's Filmot. And it's a really loaded question that we can't answer in like a minute because there's <laughs> all these tools that enhance YouTube, like TubePuddy. There's a lot of tools that enhance the chat and uh, ensure that the UI is usable. Thank you. Let's go to our next question. Paul Valhus from Austin, Texas again. How do you manage your to-do list? And on average, how many to-do items do you have in a typical day? Go ahead, Courtney. I just use Google Calendar for important things because it allows you to arrange your items or things that you need to attend to by time for each particular day. And you can have multiple calendars and have other people subscribe uh, to a specific calendar so that they don't share all of your calendar data, just that specific channel. And Peter? I, uh, I second Courtney's approach, which is exactly what I do for that same reason. 
John? Having and following a system is more important than which system you use. I use one called the Emergent Task Planner from David Sri, and I'll put a link in the chat. And Lois. And I'm struggling with the difference between a to-do list and a schedule. So my husband and I use calendar because we're both on Mac for appointments that have a time. But for a list of things that I should do, I use something called Workflowy, which is a shareable to-do list. Let's go to the next question. James Babbitt in San Diego says, which new features would you lead you to upgrade to the 12.9 inch M2 iPad Pro? Um, I think the, if I, if that was a better screen than what I had, or if it had a particular use case, I will say that um, DaVinci on there is something that I am interested in. Let's go to our next question. Douglas Carmichael. Samsung is selling 8K QLED TVs, while LG is staying with 4K for their OLED TV range. Would there be any benefit in going with 8K when most, if not all, content is 4K? Nigel? Well, of course, the most obvious one is to have one. So if you're the person that wants the latest thing, because the person with the most gadgets when they die wins, then you will put an 8K on your wall. Um, it does sum up scaling, but the reality is the only time I think we would find somebody thinking of, uh, of that end of the TV scale is A, when there's a size, um, you know, they particularly want the largest screens, you'd really need a pretty big screen to make it worth it. Or if they are installing that TV somewhere, which is not very accessible and they want to protect their investment for the future. There's really not a lot of content uh, out. Courtney? I don't think we'll be streaming or broadcasting 8K anytime soon uh, with with any, you know, uh, with a lot of material available. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, and I just bought a QLED a Samsung TV, but the 4K version. And it's just a waste of money, really, to do the 8K because the upscaler, as you learn when you get a 4K version, when you start seeing some of those that uh, 640 by 480 material that it upscales to 4K, you'll know that upscaling it to 8K is going to look even worse as you blow up all those bad artifacts. So uh, I'd say stay away from 8K for now. It's just a waste of power and a waste of money because you're not going to be really utilizing that resolution. And Mitchell, you have the final word. I do? Wow. Hold on, let me write this down. Uh, I'm I'm with oh, Courtney there on you that. Go. I think that was it. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it cut me off. Um, I I think that 8K is just overkill. Unless you have a very special need for it, um, the average person can barely appreciate the uh, uh, the added uh, goodness that 4K brings. And uh, I have a hard time finding 4K material on a consistent basis on regular TV. I mean, most of it's 1080i uh, interlaced on broadcast. So they haven't even gotten there. And the other thing is when you're sitting about 15 feet away from a uh, flat panel TV, um, I challenge you to be able to tell the difference. I don't think most people can see the difference between um, even 1080 and 4K and definitely 8K. Um, it might look slightly more you know, uh, impressive in a comparison, but I think that it's well ahead of its time in terms of the need uh, to go to 8K. So hold your money, save your money, because the only people that can afford those giant 8K screens are people with tons of money to throw away. Well, thank you. Oh, there was another word, Mitchell. All right. Well, thank you, panel. It was a fantastic uh, session. Thank you for showing up and having uh, just this wonderful store of knowledge. Um, we are going to continue now to the second part of our program. We have our education hour bringing with uh, John Snyder. Uh, John, uh, what are you going to be discussing today? I think you muted, John. <laughs> I had a double mute there. Thanks, Josh. Uh, for education hour today, we'll be talking about how education is meant to prepare learners for the real world. Specifically, we'll discuss how schools and organizations can support special education students as they transition to the workforce. Whether you're in the corporate world or the education side of that equation, we'd love to hear and see your questions and comments when we come back in about five minutes.
Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Good job, Lois. Great having you as reader. Thank you. Now, is the stream off at this point? So we have an intermission that allows us to onboard our uh, education folks. And then when the clock finishes, um, we'll open up and John will take it as the host of the second hour. Okay. And they're still hearing us though, right? Um, I never can tell. <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. Oh, there's Aaron. Hello, Aaron. I hear you're going to be doing reading for the second hour. That I am. That I am. Yeah. Good morning, Lois. Good morning. So it was a fun show, the first hour. The short answer, Josh and Lois, is yes, YouTube is still broadcasting audio. That's Good. right. Then they can hear us greeting each other and doing all stuff. So, Aaron, you're going to take over the mic checks for the second hour. Is this correct? I won't be doing mic checks. Um, oh. We've already taken care of that ahead. Yeah, and we'll have it so where after the timer, we'll be able to just get right into right into things. Sounds good. Yeah. We only okay. do that once per show. Hmm? All right, and new folks, I assume, get it done in the pre in the pre room. <laughs> Yeah, we, we've talked about too, um, having that intermission might be something that you'll see in the regular part of the show. And we have some, maybe some spoken content that we'll have for the break. So the education hour is paving the way for the future of our Always broadcast. is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, have a good day. And I guess I will leave since somebody else is doing all this stuff. Have a good day, Lois. Bye-bye. See you Wednesday. Morning. Good morning, Laura, Aaron, Harshit. Good morning, everybody. So the next step is our super source check. So if our new panelists can take the active speaker for a spin. Yes, good morning, Josh. Good morning, John, Aaron, Tony, Harshid. Um, yeah, I'm kind of excited about this this morning and uh, I think we've got some good information. Nice, looking forward to it. And Aaron, how are you doing? I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. Um, sadly, I finally succumbed to the uh, getting of COVID. But oh dear. But today I'm feeling a lot better. So I figured I should put my mind towards good things versus trying to go back to bed. So this is definitely helping me get a little bit better. Well, thanks for sticking it out and uh, showing up today. Appreciate it. And panelists, please raise your hand on the test question. Have a good show, John. Thank you much.
Welcome back. We have a power-packed panel full of educators, parents, people who work in the corporate world, and people who are interested in our topic today. We'd love to have your questions from our producers and comments in the Mukana chat. October is Disability Employment Awareness Month, and today we'll be discussing how we transition special education students to the workforce. And on a side note, if we hear someone say SPED today, I learned, out, learned earlier this week that that's just an abbreviation for special education. So we'll start with general discussion, and then we'll answer any questions that we have in Mukana. Who'd like to get us started today? How about you, Erin? All right. Good morning, John, and good morning, all. So special education um, is a very special topic to me, so I can't wait to jump in and hear some of these questions. So our first question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. Where do you see remote and virtual work fitting into the vocational rehabilitation millennium? Milieu. Sorry. Uh, no hands yet, but what we'll do is we'll go to how about a general discussion while we wait for a couple hands to show up here. Um, Harshid, can you share a little bit about your experience um, as a student with disability? Absolutely. So uh, with the transition from, uh, let's just say, uh, let's just go back to uh, college days. Uh, when I went through the transition phase, I first started a job at a uh, radio station uh, filling out or basically doing, um, taking each disc or CD or records in the studio and then uh, writing it down into a database. And that was you know, it, it's a typical job uh, of data entry in that time frame. Uh, this is around 2005. And with that transition uh, job or a, uh, a nonprofit that did, did take care of me, they offered, you know, any type of job. But I, I recall maybe 10 years after when I met a friend, he's like, hey, do you know that you gave up all the good jobs and you took like, you know, the job at a DJ studio thing? I'm like, did I? And that in itself taught me that I took my native skills of what I had because of my vision. And I thought that other people might need a little push because not everybody is willing to uh, accommodate per se, or you might get accommodation from a uh, corporation entity, a business, but you might feel, you know, internally that you're not capable of maybe achieving a, a well-paying job or you might have a, a couple of things that hold you back. So along the way, I went to college and first thing I did the first day, actually, when I dropped off my application at college is I got a job as a work study uh, through the Pell Grant. And with that, it taught me not only the factor of why you should at least try or ask, because you never know who's going to hire you. And for me personally, it was a objective of, hey, I'm going to ask this person if I think I'm qualified to do the job and why not try? And so that transition for me became a really a big pillar in my uh, college journey. In my college journey, it took me to work for the Office of Students with Disability. Uh, it took me to opportunities to work with uh, uh, the, the business, uh, we called it the business department, but it was the business IT department of the college. So within those structures, I figured from what I know personally from, you know, your math and uh, STEM classes and everything else, you have to at least have some personal skills. And with those personal skills came introduction to entities like Lighthouse Central Florida. And that was you know, finally, like, okay, I'm, I'm losing my vision. How do I really engage with uh, getting that portion better? So my transitions were education as a normal human, whatever normal is, uh, regular college, public schooling, but transitions then became, and they're still becoming today, as I lose my vision to reaccommodate myself and ask questions and making sure that people understand that we're all human beings at the end of the day, instead of saying, hey, wait, uh, uh, special education. You know, sometimes that word, I'd rather be more special because I am more special to a event or a corporation rather than, you know, the factor of 
special education because we don't necessarily need it to be special. It's just we're trying to access and, you know, the term accessibility, the, the main prefix of the word is access. And we just want to access information. So I'll pass on the torch and would love to hear from others. All right. Um, I'll pick it up there. I am a parent of two students with special needs. One of my children has autism in a moderate form on the spectrum, and the other has a rare genetic disorder called Cornelia de Lange, as well as severe autism. So uh, he's mostly nonverbal. And, uh, you know, when I think of special education or their individual education plans or IEPs, what I think of mostly is what do we do? How do we make the classroom work for my children? And how do we put whatever situations or any um, requi not requirements, even it's it's what kind of space do they need to learn what they need to learn? And as a parent, when we're going into our IEPs, that's what I'm thinking about is um, how do we enable my students, my kids to learn what they need to learn at the same time as all the other students who fit into maybe a, a little bit more of a canned approach. And um, it's an interesting dilemma to have as a parent to have to try to argue for your student as well as um, try to understand what helps other students too and trying to be a good citizen. And I think it's an, an, a conversation that goes into the workforce too. As a hiring manager, you know, we've had people who are parts of different programs with different disabilities. And it's the same question is how do we make sure that this person has what they need to give their best. And so I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, Aaron, I see that your hand is up. So I just wanted to jump in and just, you know, throw my credentials in here in that I'm a third grade teacher. And out of the past six years, I have taught in a co-teaching model for the past three of them. And I get to work with students on the autism spectrum. And I absolutely love this program. I love how we have a general education teacher and a special ed teacher in the same classroom so that we can work with all the students. And what is so great is that the kids who I call neurotypicals, so students that um, don't have autism, don't have ADHD, don't have um, something like that, they are so helpful and they are so amazing towards these students. And then the students on the spectrum get to learn from the others about behaviors and how to fit in with different groups of students. And I think it is so great to see them interacting together. So we're able to take those um, questions that parents have and say, we can help your child. Here's how we're going to do that. And we have all these things that we do in our classrooms that are able to get the kids all together so that everybody gets what they need, but nobody is left out whether they are neurotypical or neurodiverse. So that's why I'm very excited to be on this panel today. And Aaron, since you're teaching a, a younger age group, you know, nine years before most will leave school and sometimes even up to 15 or 16 years before they leave primary education, what kinds of things are you thinking through and preparing for your third graders uh, when you have that end in mind of helping them be productive adults? That's a great question. Um, the first thing I think the most basic is helping them regulate their emotions. So regardless of what um, what difficulty students might have, anytime that they're thrown a challenge, they have to learn how to deal with that, both in the classroom and in the real world. And I feel as if if educators can give them that very baseline experience of how to regulate your emotions, identifying your emotions and knowing ways to cope with that in the moment is incredibly helpful. So things that we do are every morning we do a zones of regulation check in and we say, like, what are you feeling and how can we get out of it? And students will help others with that. Lots of movement breaks and things like yoga and mindfulness to remind everybody that, you know, you can't do it yet, as growth mindset would say. You might not be able to do something yet, but you will be able to. But giving them those really basic, um, those very basic skills, I think, are the most important. Everything else, once you're on an emotional level that is calm and you're able to think about the academics, teachers can teach anything and kids can learn. 
anything as long as they're in the right headspace to do so. So I think that is the most key thing we can do for our kids in order to help them not only in school, but outside of school and then in the workforce as well. Thank you. And Tony, can you give a a brief introduction to your experience working with uh, special education students? Thanks, uh, John. Um, I've worked, uh, I guess I need to go backwards in order. So my last uh, three years was in high school, um, high school autism. My students were what you would consider low functioning students. And they had uh, very little social skills. The unique thing about my experience um, was that I had actually three classrooms. One classroom was a traditional classroom. Uh, The second classroom was what you would consider a home environment where there were beds and dressers and a kitchen and anything that you would find in your in your um, home as far as the kitchen is concerned. And then we had what would be called a living space. So we had the traditional classroom. We had the uh, kitchen or home setting. And then we had the vocational uh, environment, which would be considered like a workshop or factory where the students were required to put things together. And so it was uh, monumental in that uh, I think I had the best of both worlds. In the, in the regular classroom, we had the use of iPads and computers so that the students can do uh, adaptive technology if needed in terms of whatever they whatever the needs were in terms of communication, uh, sign language, with anything that they needed we had the opportunity to use the iPads. And that at that time, we're talking about 2010, 11, 12, there was all kinds of software that were on these new devices called iPads that these students were able to maximize um, of the use of. And then we had the you know, they had to go into the kitchen and work on how to prepare meals and how to make up the bed and and how to how to function in uh, a living environment. And then we had the workspace where they had to put things together, take things apart, uh, build blocks, uh, all kinds of uh, vocational, technical factory, automated work environment situation. So it was kind of, for me, the best of both worlds in that we we had an opportunity, particularly in the home setting, to work on social skills and have particular interactions and stuff with the students. And then I had an opportunity to work for two years as a as a educator support person that went to the Marcus Center in Atlanta and work with the student one-on-one. And that was a very interesting experience in that I was assigned to one student at this facility, which is the Marcus Institute in, in Atlanta. And we went through processes of helping this individual move from where he initially started out as a nonverbal person with with limited social skills to moving him up to the uh, up to a higher level of functioning and independence. And so that was that was a unique experience. And then I had before that, I had the experience of working outside of the school setting and working as a a a social worker and that the students that I work with were um, special needs students. And I had to be an advocate for them, uh, report to the school settings and advocate for the students to make sure that they got all of their needs and and was there to facilitate all of the support that they needed in their IEPs. So I've sort of been across the board. And then when I first graduated from college, I worked for three years as a substitute teacher or supply te- long-term supply teacher. So I had a classroom that I had for actually uh, two years. 
And so uh, in, in between all that time, I did all kinds of uh, social work and uh, other work with big brothers, big sisters. And I've always had interaction with, with students and children. So, Awesome. Thank you very much. And we have a special guest today, Laura Thompson, who's normally on the back end making everything run in office hours, is coming to share us. She's actually done quite a bit of research on the employment rates as well as education levels of people with various disabilities. Uh, Laura, what are your thoughts? Good morning. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have, I actually have a lot of thoughts. Um, I'm going to start my screen share here. But one of the first things I wanted to say was that, and it's not doing what I want it to do. There it goes. Okay. Um, there are a lot of different um, reasons and factors. Disability is only one of them when we're looking at um, these numbers. And also that, remember, this is all disabilities. This is not, this is, this is popularly, this is the population. This is taken from the American Community Survey. This is anybody that is not institutionalized from the ages of 21 to 64. This is the high, and, and um, it's it's uh, important to remember that because that means you're including all disabilities, um, all levels of disabilities. So um, this is a good thing to remember. Um, if you can, it, um, on my screen now, you can see here, um, there's four icons. The first icon of the schoolhouse is less than a high school diploma. The second ice icon is those who have taught their highest level of education is a high school diploma. The third icon down is some college or, or a two-year technical degree. And the bottom icon would be those with a four-year degree or higher. And what age groups are we looking at? Um, ages 21 to 64. So they've pretty much aged out of the um, K through 12 system and what they, if you look, so if you look at the right side or the left side of my screen, you see, this is those who do not have a disability and their, and their highest level of education that has been attained. It's a very natural flow that the higher of level, the more people have attained that level. But if you look at the other side of the screen, it's very interesting that the smallest bar, the smallest percent group are those with the highest levels of education. And um, so I'm gonna go on here. We're gonna look now specifically at uh, the employment rates of that group of less than a high school diploma. So if you have less than a high school diploma without a disability, you still have a 67, 60% 7% of that population is still employed where with a disability, it's only 22%. And this particular pattern continues through all of the levels. But we get to here, um, you notice that this was the smallest percentage of people with a disability of educational attainment, but yet they have the highest rate of employment. And if you actually, this is the one that like when I saw this and realized this, I was shocked. If you take the population with no disability and a high school and less than a high school diploma, 67% of them are able to still be employed. You take your disability population with a four-year college degree or higher, so this includes all bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees. They still only, after getting that much education, have a 50, 57% of them are employed. And I'm gonna stop my screen share. That's shocking. Any any thoughts as to why or suggestions on what we can do about it as a country or as a globe? Part of it becomes the 
idea that employers don't necessarily understand that when they're when they're talking to somebody, number one, our laws here in the United States say that an a employer cannot ask if you have a disability. And with any form of disability that is apparent by speech, by sight, um, as soon as you hand me something to read, you can obviously tell there's something wrong with my eyes. There's a misconception about what this person can do. Um, also, they could be concerned that if they put somebody with a disability onto their insurance, that insurance rates will go up. Um, my best advice is to be open-minded. There are also programs, I think we'll get into this a little bit later, where um, through state vocational rehabilitation, I know here in Texas, they have a 12-week work program where the state pays the employees' work wages for 12 weeks to go in and do a paid work experience. And there is no requirement on the employer after those 12 weeks to hire that employee. It's to give them the experience. It's to give the person with a disability the experience. All right. Well, that's a great prompt for us. And now we'll start diving into your questions. So if you have you producers out there have questions or comments you'd like to share, please put them into Mukana for us. And that will drive the rest of our conversation today. Aaron, what's our first first question? OK, so I believe we saw we did that question. Uh, Tony, I think you had uh, some feedback or wanted to answer the question as far as where do we see remote virtual work fitting into vocational rehabilitation? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I think this is a unique time in which we live in terms of being able to to utilize some of the bells and whistles that we have exposure to. And by that, I mean the fact that we are having the conversation that we are having right now and that we need to be willing to share this technology with all groups across the board. And so you could say that um, in the past, you were only, you were only able to, to reach out to individuals locally because the, the resources had to be in place in that environment. We're now able to actually have a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting or some other type of social interaction through camera and microphone. And because of the way in which technology is growing, we now are able to break down barriers or walls that can create a more virtual in a virtual classroom or workspace for people to be able to interact and have uh, training, have more um, opportunities to develop themselves and show or demonstrate the things that they can do. So I think this is a unique time. And I think it's just a matter of us maximizing this opportunity and using the resources that are available. And I, I did want to say one more uh, comment to um, all of the great information that Laura was sharing with us, that I think we're at a point in time where there needs to be more of a squeaky wheel kind of conversation in that it's important for us to talk about the disparity in terms of people with disabilities not having as many opportunities as possible. Part of the reason for that is if you look at it, there are, there are tons and tons of working opportunities that existed that now exist because of the pandemic. And a lot of people have not come back to work. So this is a time, a great time to, to be able to say to the larger world, hey, we have these people that are sitting over here on the side that have great skills. They have 
they may have something that impedes them being able to use all of the things that are in place in terms of a building structure, but they don't need it because they can come in virtually or they can work from home and be able to utilize the skills that they have. And if you give them a chance, they will show you what they can do. So I just wanted to mention, I think it's important for us to, you know, the, we don't need to necessarily be, you know, just accept the fact that the data shows what it shows. It's, it's time to say, hey, you have a population of people who can provide the service that you need. Just give them a chance. Exactly. What do you think, Laura? Yeah. And um, I wanted to gently make this comment. I personally have experienced this. There was an employer that while I was getting my bachelor's degree, I was interested in working for. They're a pretty big name. Like they're all over the place. And I applied and I, I could always get the interview, but I was never hired. And I applied the summer after I got my bachelor's degree, I applied again, got the interview thinking, okay, here we go again. And the first thing the, um, interviewer said to me is, you're now overqualified. We're going to hire you, but we expect within six months, you'd be moving to our corporate office because what you've applied to do is way beneath you. And it was that, I don't know if it was because I got a different person that could see past the disability, but like literally I could get the interview, but getting jobs without a bachelor's degree was so hard. And I worked for them for about four and a half years until I got, until I finished my master's, I was actually able to get in at the university, but yes. Um, and to Douglas, back to Douglas's actual question, I believe that technology is the great leveler for um, playing fields. There's so many, uh, um, and it's so easy to make things, to modify things at the remote case by case basis. And yeah, so I do think it's going to be a more, um, it's going to give us a better chance. I 100% agree with both of you with when you think about it, people's homes are designed around their needs. And the fact that so much work can now be done from home means that most of that accessibility issues that can be very expensive to build into buildings is already done for employers. And there's a huge population during a tight labor crunch of people who are looking for jobs. And as we saw, are highly educated and um, more than qualified, but for various reasons and um, various, uh, I can't even think of the word. Um, it's an unfair playing field is what it ultimately is. And one of my jobs at the call center is I basically run the team that builds schedules for everybody. And the technology is at a place now where we could have people sign up for their own shifts and identify what times they can work. So if somebody had um, a disability that made it so they could only work 30 minutes at a time and they needed a three minute break, like you can just write that into the program and accommodate that person's needs. Or it could be, you know, certain days they could um, work or and all this, they don't have to drive into the office and spend eight hours at the office and drive back. You can split shifts. You can have the work be done when the person can do the work. Um, and there's many, many jobs out there that can do that. Where we're missing the connection is the connection between the school and the workplace to to connect those gaps. Uh, what's the next question, Aaron? Great question so far. Our next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. We had an enthusiastic discussion about Office Hours presenters showing detail when showing intricate detailed graphics. How can the presenter show details more effectively? I could take this question uh, to start and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks. A few of the most important things you can do when especially sharing visuals as a sighted person myself, um, so I'm probably the least qualified person on this panel to ask, I've never had glasses, but the size of icons or information you use, the contrast you use makes a big difference. And what Laura demonstrated really well is she described the layout of the slide 
so that someone who maybe had a harder time visualizing it would be able to follow along and understand what we're talking about. So I think it's a combination of audio description plus doing everything you can to remove distraction and make the most important information visible when we're talking about a slide deck. What do you think, Aaron? I completely agree, John. I completely agree. I think to add on to what you said, I think it's really important no matter what the age or whoever you're presenting to, the less words on the screen, the better. It's much more advantageous to share your idea verbally because usually you can add more intricacies when you're talking versus when you're typing something out. Because I know when I've even had to leave substitute plans and I get very verbose and, you know, when I come back the next day, people are like, well, it's a little tough to read, but your slides for your kids were perfect. They had very minimal words on them. They had a timer on them. You know, they were bright and colorful to keep their attention, but it wasn't overwhelming. So I think that's the biggest thing to keep the amount of words at a minimum so that you can talk through them, but also have some sort of visual for them to actually look at. Thanks. Laura? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we worked really hard on when we designed the slide deck I just did is even though we had color to differentiate things, never, ever, ever use color as the only vehicle to convey meaning. Um, you want, you can use color to separate for visual, but you want to give some kind of text indicator of what the difference is or shape indicator or something. Um, it's one of the biggest things that I have uh, learned um, working around um, and even in my own uh, struggles with accessibility. Color, um, we, could, we could talk about, I could talk about some of the stuff for hours, but um, yeah, that would be the big single comment I would make. Thank you, Laura. I'm curious to hear what Peter has to say about this. Well, <laughs> there's the obvious one. You have to be careful about colors. I mean, even in what looks like someone who doesn't have accessibility problems, you know, a third of the population has, male population has some form of red-green color blindness. So you have to, you have to take that into account. Um, the other thing is Paul asked the question about showing intricate detailed graphics. And my answer is don't. Right, that's not what a, a slide presentation is not what those are for. Simplify your graphics as much as possible. The other one I would say is what's interesting about Laura, I'm gonna go back to Laura's data is, um, it's interesting that it stops at 64 because there's some recent research from Gartner Group that talks about another category of accessibility and that's the aging population and the illnesses that are associated with the aging population. I mean, I don't know how old Tony is. I'm, I'm 65 and I have cataracts. I will have to get them repaired, but they do interfere with my vision as it currently stands today. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Harshid, what are your thoughts? So I guess I need to go get those cataracts removed too. Uh, you see, we're all alike. It doesn't matter about age. Um, and with the experiences that I've had with, let's say, intricate graphics and such to the question, intricate graphics are okay if you're going to explain what you mean by intricate, right? So if there is a bar chart or any kind of graphical uh, structure on a slide, I want to note to that person that, hey, I want you to look at this piece of information and say, the important part here is the age group of 65 and 21 year olds. So your eyes should go to those colors as you know, you're know you comparing these two functions. Um, if you're using, let's just say a video or anything else um, and other graphics on your uh, showcase, the main point is you wanna make the text look big and you wanna have the attention at your title because your eyes are gonna go up at the big picture. The graphics there that lie underneath that, and if you're going to present it to, let's say, give it to them as a uh, post project or a post product, you want to make sure if it's 
a uh, e file that it has alternative tags. So if the picture has resemblance of, let's say, the, the information of 21 to 64 year olds or whatever the information might be, that might be justified in that picture. Or it says Laura is standing with a dog next to her. You know, that information could be the important part that she has a dog. Right. And so the graphics also do have language to it. It's just how you speak when you present and that ties up the presentation together. So, Thanks, Harshid. All this conversation on one small question about how do I show a graphic in a slide deck. Laura, uh, you had some more? I just wanted to answer Peter's question about why it's ages 21 to 64, because that is the age range where um, they've aged out of the K through 12 system and they are, and the, that is the lowest bar to full retirement. That's why these were actually federally done numbers. And I believe that is why when we're looking at employment rates, they use that box. Good clarification. And rounding the question with Tony. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I think it's important. Everything that has been said is, is valuable information. And simply for the presenters, consider your audience. Consider your audience. That's the most important thing that needs to be. Anytime you're doing something, consider your audience. Thanks, Tony. And that's true of all audiences. Next question, please. Our next question comes to us from John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. What can hiring managers do to reduce their bias during an interview? One thing as a hiring manager, um, I'm curious is how can I be better at making sure I get the right people in the job? And I know I myself am biased in any of these conversations, they can be very sensitive um, just in general, like even here in the panel today, we might make mistakes. And I think it's important to be quick to apologize and, and quick to think about the other person. Um, so Laura, what are some of your thoughts on reducing bias? Number one, be aware of the resources out there to you. Um, most state vocational rehabilitation institutes um, offer the, the state vocational rehabilitation, no matter what it's called in your state. Um, every state calls it something different. Here in Texas, it's our Texas Workforce Commission. Um, Pennsylvania, it's Pennsylvania Career Link, but they all have. Nowadays, it's usually your vocational rehabilitation, your state um, unemployment compensation, and your state job centers are all under one umbrella and whatever they've chosen to call that. Um, so it's sometimes a little bit more difficult to find nowadays. Um, but the there are programs out there for employers, like there's a tax credit that goes to the employer's business taxes for hiring somebody with a disability. And um, so I, I highly encourage you to reach out to those people who are trying, because they're, they're directly linked to those people who are working on the other end with the students and those with a disability trying to get the job and make it more of an open conversation. What suggestions do you have, Tony? Educate, educate the hiring managers. One of the ways in which you educate the hiring manager is to show them or demonstrate to them that this population can do the work. And so for most businesses, it's about the bottom line. If these people can provide a service that enriches the business, the business can make money by using these individuals. They don't care about the disabilities any longer. They care about the fact that these people can do the work. If they can do the work, then that will remove the biases that these hiring managers have. Thank you. Harshid? I take it back to remember we're all human beings. So if you have a need for a specific uh, call center, let's just say, uh, if someone has a skill, we want to make sure we're pushing them forward rather than putting them into the circle of you're going to constantly do this call center job. Um, motivation is the key to many things. And even as a manager, being stressed out brings in biases because you need to fill that position by the end of the day. And 
that is a bias on its own because you have to do that and you're stuck on one side. Whereas if you have a open-minded uh, conversation with whomever, why do you want the job or why can this job be effective for you and me together, then you might uh, find more uh, better uh, positions within your, your, your organization to, to implement better ideas as a team rather than one individual that is going to be stuck on a bias. Thank you all very much. Uh, as a hiring manager, it's important to remember it's not just about the bottom line. When we think that way, um, we dehumanize all of our employees and we need to consider the person in front of us and what they can do rather than focusing on what they can't do or what accommodation you need to have. And I think it's I think a lot of times people are very afraid in an interview situation that they'll make a mistake. And so they just don't say anything at all or they just make it awkward, or they allow themselves to be thrown off because someone appears different or sounds different. So some things that are common tools that you can always use to reduce any sort of bias are anonymize the hiring process. So removing people's names from resumes. And another example is asking the same interview questions with the same criteria of all candidates and having multiple interviews that assess not just how well they answer a question, but whether or not the person has the skill required to, to learn the job. And I think what Laura brought up was a really important point as far as there are programs that help reduce the risk for employers if you're concerned about it. Like in Texas, the program Laura was describing is basically a 12-week trial run with no risk to the employer that's just asking them, will you give this person a chance to get through training? And 12 weeks is more than enough to get most people through their basic training. Erin, what's our next question? Our next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What is a great head mounted magnification device and how do you effectively use a cell phone for magnification and take close up pictures? Laura? There are a couple of head worn magnification devices. We're going in now more to like the, they look like virtual reality goggles. Um, two of them that I'm thinking of are the Iris Vision, the eSight. And there's a couple more, they're expensive. And as far as the cell phone, my best recommendation is to A, get the largest cell phone screen you can afford with the best camera. And then take the picture, make sure it's focused as best you can. Um, it's sometimes hard with being shaky. I've, I'm, I'm still looking for a really good, like, stand to lay my cell phone flat and put something underneath it and take a picture of it. But I haven't quite come up with one yet uh, commercially. And then pinch to zoom on the picture. Great. Harshid? So uh, Envision AI is a company that has partnered up with Google that uses the Google Glass. They use an 8 megapixel camera. And if you have glasses, you could have a version with glasses or just a frame around uh, which has like a camera uh, functionality. Uh, the importance of that is they're trying to make a platform where I could say, hey, Aaron, could you help me see this? And I could contact Aaron because she might be part of my uh, list. Uh, or I could use an app called Be My Eyes and connect to anybody any time of day. Um, the other one is Ira. Ira is a paid uh, company. Or you pay for your services, but if you have important work, uh, they have a career mode, for example. So if I'm making PowerPoint slides or anything like that, I could use Ira uh, on that uh, variable. Uh, main thing to note is many of these companies are using Samsung VR headsets and then they're putting software on top. So your, uh, you know, it, it may vary with your experiences. Uh, most phones these days on Android, you have Google Lookout and Assisted Vision. You have Seeing AI as apps on uh, the iPhone. They are giving a lot of functionality. So if you just have a rig, like uh, the small rig that we all talk about here on the channel, or uh, even just a harness that you wear on you, you could potentially get the same camera and information. Uh, it's just if you're trying to magnify something in specific, there are many different software apps that are f giving you functionality. So wearables are coming up uh, really, really quickly. Um, it's just the cost right now. And I think with a lot of accessibility, it's the major cost, four or $5,000 for pieces of equipment that could be, you know, a thousand to 2000 would be better, so. 
And if anyone on the in the, any of our producers are interested in volunteering, a lot of these services also require volunteer populations to be the other person's eyes, for example. So thank you very much, Rashid. Tony? And to answer Peter's original question about how old I am, I'm, I'm 64, will be 65 in February. And I have had serious issues with my eyes. And so what one of the things that I have become able to do that is working extremely well for me, I have tons and tons of books that were fantastic for me to be able to utilize when I was a young man. But now I cannot use them. So I found out about using the notes app and the camera feature. I will scan a document that I need to read. Um, and I, when I use that, I am able to scan the entire document, a whole page and the print can be teeny tiny. Even with my glasses, I still have trouble. I am able to, to utilize the, the scanning app and notes to make anything as large as I need it to be able to read it. It works great. It's included in the latest update of the iOS software. So this is something that I'm sure that you can use on the Android as well. But this particular feature is amazing in the Apple iPhone Notes app to use. You just click on the camera, you can scan the document. It works fantastic. Thank you. And Peter. I was, thank you, Tony. I was going to bring up the, that particular part of the app. The other one I would suggest you, that I've learned to use, again, for old, tired eyes, is, uh, is I will take a picture. And Laura, I appreciate you trying to find something to hold steady while you take that picture of something. I will then tell, tell the iPhone to convert it to black and white and adjust the contrast because you'll pick that up a whole lot easier than trying to see subtle colors. Great, next question. Our next question comes to us from Peter Sargent in Round Rock, Texas. Laura, in the data you presented, there was there a clear delineation between employed versus employable? Laura? No, um, there's a whole nother set of data that is not employed, but currently looking, but that's a whole different way you pull the data. Um, I, uh, I don't have those numbers in front of me. Um, I can post my source for, and there's actually a new set of data. That's actually the 2018 data. They just posted the 2019 American Community Survey data. This is actually data out of Cornell University. Laura, in your research, was there anything else that just really struck you as um, surprising or interesting? What, there are some other, um, like I said, there is, when I started this, I started with like 20 sets of different data. And I ended up focusing on this particular set. I would have to go back and actually look at each set, but this was the one thing that kind of jumped out and I latched on to. Fair enough. Next question. Our next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Anyone going to South by Southwest Education March 6th through 9th, 2023, either physically or virtually, is it worth office hours coverage? March is a long way away for me. <laughs> I, I know I won't be going physically, but I think I will probably be looking at the overall agenda and seeing if there are certain sessions virtually that I can attend uh, at minimal cost to myself, uh, just because I'm interested in the field generally. But I see we have a few other panelists who've uh, raised their hands as well. How about you, Aaron? So I know I won't be attending physically because I am still in school at that time. I don't my breaks are February and April, not in March. But I just checked out the website to look at some of the presenters. And there are some pretty good presenters in terms of um, like health and well-being and accessibility and inclusion, things like that um, with practice and pedagogy. So some of these do look really interesting. Um, I would have to do a deeper dive to see if it's office hours worthy. But I think I would attend 
some of the sessions virtually if it's if it fits in my school schedule. Great. And Laura. Yeah, um, I know that this is the week before, so I will be getting ready for spring break. And on spring break, my intention is to actually go to another specifically accessibility um, techn assistive technology conference in California. So depending upon it, yeah, I want to look at it virtually, but um, I don't know right now what finances and time are going to allow. Great. Next question. Our next question comes to us from John Snyder. How can people find out what resources are available for students with disabilities? What should they be searching for in Google? I know that every school system has some programs um, in most states, I assume every state, the state of Nevada does, has programs. It's a little hard to get involved in. And I think a good starting point for most people, if you have children with disabilities, is your pediatrician. Your pediatrician's office should be well equipped to understand the local resources, including um, different programs to help your children get onto Medicaid. Uh, both of my children are on Nevada Medicaid through a program called Nevada Checkup. But we start with our pediatrician. Sometimes the school teachers will know that information as well. But usually you'll have some sort of um, group. Ours is called this regional center. And in the state of Nevada, it's broken into three different groups. So we're in the Sierra Regional Center, which is a group that handles all of northern Nevada in the Reno area and connects families with um, a single person who can represent them, who can help them navigate the different social systems and help them sign up for different programs. Uh, Aaron, what should we be looking for? So a, a, a non-Google search would actually be your local library. Finding groups and finding information um, about what disability your, your child has, that you can read up on it as a parent and involve your kid in knowing like what they need, like knowing what they need, so that when you go to school and you can say to the, to the teachers there, this is what works for my child so that they are already ahead of the game in terms of how to help your child on a daily basis. So I think bare minimum, knowing more about from your pediatrician, your child's disability and how you can help them is beneficial. Thank you. Laura? Um, one of the things that I would recommend is as your children get older, <laughs> Research the difference between the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, um, IDEA, because once they leave K through 12, there is a different standard of accessibility. And it's unfortunately not higher, it's in some degrees lower. IDEA guarantees success at the K through 12 level based on individualized goals, where once you get to post-secondary education and in the workforce, it's all around access. One thing I did want to say is that employers, there are what they call essential job functions. And no matter what your disability is, an employer does not have to remove an essential job function for a employee. They can, they can modify them if they choose to, but there's nothing in the law that says they have to. Correct. And they do are required to make reasonable accommodation uh, for people, which is the other half of that coin as far as you can't require somebody to do a job, like if it's essential to the job and someone can't do that essential, like that's the purpose of the essential job function. But most organizations and what we do is we'll typically, if someone has a disability where they can't complete an essential job function that comes up, we'll find an alternative um, team for them to work on or find a way to modify the amount of work with a reasonable accommodation to fill that gap. Tony? I just wanted to add that I think it's important to to grow the advocacy for your person, child, or adult as much as possible, not just when they're K through 12, but throughout their life. 
so that it becomes even more important as the parents age that they have advocates for their their child or adult that can be there for them in the midst of the parents, you know, passing away. And so we we don't want to minimize the need for advocacy just when um, children are K through 12. It becomes even more important as they age because, you know, as Laura said, you know, things, um, the, the resources and the the, the support of the government to ensure that certain things are in place dwindles. And if the advocacy is in place throughout their life and even more so as they age, that becomes a positive experience for, for those individuals. Thanks. And I do want to recognize that we are talking very U.S. centric in the panel today. And so if anyone is listening from another country and you have experience in the education world, we'd love to have you join our education hours as a panelist or in the chat. Um, but we're working with what we know. And so we'll finish up tonight today with two brief questions. So we'll keep our answers pretty short. Uh, what's our next question? Our next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. So it looks like a website, so meta.com for Quest Pro is taking orders for $1,500. What are implications for the visually impaired? Yeah, MetaQuest is a uh, Facebook-based uh, virtual reality headset. Uh, one implication is that their wallets will be lighter. What do you think, Harshid? Yeah, so the the accessibility that Facebook has shown before they were Facebook better and all that has been uh, abysmal. So uh, $1,500 is a waste of money for me, perspectively, there. And I wanted to just touch on a quick question from previously. National Federation of the Blind, American Council for the Blind, American Foundation for the Blind are all three resources here in the States. Uh, RNIB, uh, the Royal National Institute for the Blind in UK. Uh, so if anybody does need resources in that regard, uh, those are great places to at least see what, you, what they have available, even if you're a parent of a blind child or uh, you yourself could be blind. Um, and uh, the one thing that I wanted to just state there is um, your Department of Education is usually the one funding the uh, if you need any help, so Department of Education is who runs Division of Blind Services here in Florida. Uh, other places have DSS or other uh, formats of uh, places, but the IEP and all of these words that we've been talking about here in the States, they all will matter the same way. If you do have any uh, need, go through the Department of Education and then get something going and then use these other resources like the uh, foundations and uh, uh, councils and such as a resource to maybe get help to pay for some of the pieces of equipment or stuff like that. So just wanted to share that bit. Thanks, Harshid. And if we can get these links into the chat, I'm sure people would appreciate it. What's our last question, Erin? Our last question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What are some tips and tricks for people with disabilities to navigate city and country streets? Erin? I think what's really helped, I know myself a lot, even as a seeing person, is my Apple Watch with um, maps in that whenever I put in directions, even if I'm driving, it'll buzz either on the left or the right side of my watch to let me know which way I'm supposed to go. Seems pretty helpful. Thank you. Harshid? Google Maps, Way Maps. There's a ton of applications these days. Lazarillo is another one. You download it on your phone and it'll give you almost step-by-step -step direction and uh, even the vehicle direction. And remember that accessibility helps everybody. So continue to fight for and use accessibility features. Uh, thank you, panel, for the riveting discussion today. I love that our Saturday discussions all end up being about helping other people grow. Of course, we couldn't do it without our fantastic producers in the driver's seat. Thank you for your questions. And those on the back end who keep the show rolling. Thank you also. Especially to those who are training today. I know it's hard and we made it a little bit harder for you at different points today. Uh, it's a tremendous effort to get this show done from all sides and we appreciate the effort. Over the next two weeks, we'll be taking a more practical turn. So next Saturday, we'll be, I'll be sharing you some tips and tricks on how to breathe life into your slide deck with animation. And since many teachers use PowerPoint, that will be the application of choice. The conversation will start tomorrow in Discord, so make sure that you sign up today. And then the following week after that, 
we'll be performing a ruthless redo instead of a ruthless review of a slide deck. So if anyone out there has a particularly difficult presentation you'd like us to take a look at, please feel free to contact me via Discord or LinkedIn. And if you don't, well, you'll get to see my humble progression towards PowerPoint mastery. Thank you again, everybody, for the great conversation, and we'll see you next week. Thanks all. Hope you can't hear my kids screaming in the background. Oh, it's, it's, awesome. time. it's time to play. Good week all. Good week. Hope you just want to let everybody know that John's going to be on with me Wednesday night. Awesome. If you didn't Check know. We'll be conversing. Thanks, Tony. See you guys in after hours. See you later.